Forum for Global Health and the HSE, who we're delighted are, we we're partnering with in many ways uh, through the, the Code Supporter Network on, on, on many issues. And of course, it's an absolute privilege um, to have Dr. Mike Ryan, who has come in and no doubt uh, exceptionally busy, but it's a real privilege uh, to have him on, 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 on the panel tonight. It's a real, it's a real pleasure. Um, Oh, the bishop. I think we've lost you there, Mark, a bit. I, I, there seems to be a... Uh... Sorry, there seems to be some repetition there. Um, I, uh, so do subscribe to the YouTube channel. If you're interested in call and getting involved, do look us up on callup.org. Uh, we rely in part on donations of people get, getting involved and supporting us. So if, if you're reminded, please do. Uh, and also to acknowledge then the support of Concern Worldwide in helping us run these first webs. So without any further ado, I'll hand over uh, to Neve Rooney from the Department of International Development. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Mark. And good evening, everybody. So my name is Neve Rooney and I work with the department, Munich University Department of International Development, um, working with undergrads and postgrads on our MA in International Development programme. Um, and I'm delighted to share this evening with you all and looking forward to the conversation. So as always, a very warm welcome to our online audience. Thanks a million for joining the conversation. And um, so very briefly, we'll have some introductions and initial questions for our panelists and the conversation will emerge from there. And we'll have some time uh, for questions or comments from the audience later on. So do post your questions um, or comments as the conversation progresses. And please do subscribe and share the live links to help raise awareness of and promote engagement on the issues up for discussion. It's really important that we encourage dialogue, debate and hopefully action on these issues. And bringing people into the conversation is a great place to start. So please do share. Um, now, we're delighted with our panel this evening and very grateful for your time and looking forward to hearing your perspectives. And I'll give a very brief initial introduction to each of the panel. And if they would like, if all of you would like to add uh, to that personally later on, that's fine too. So this evening, um, as Mark said, we're delighted to be joined by Dr. Mike Ryan. And Mike is the Executive Director of the World Health Organization Emergencies Programme and has been a key actor for over 25 years in acute risks to global health and emergency preparedness and response. He's a founding member of the Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network, which has aided the response to hundreds of disease outbreaks globally. And he has vast experience with epidemic response, including the World Health Organization response to the SARS outbreak and senior advisor to the Global Polio Eradication Initiative and much, much more. Um, we also have Nadine Ferris France, who is the executive director of the Irish Global Health Network, Network and Esther Ireland. And Nadine has over 20 years experience in gender, HIV and global health and extensive experience with global, regional and national civil society networks on HIV and TB. And she has worked with the World Health Organization and other UN agencies and is currently an adjunct lecturer with the University of Limerick. And um, we also have David Wickliam, who is a Global Health uh, Programme Director in the HSE and a Medical Specialist in General Practice and Public Health Medicine. He's experienced in global health, including 12 years uh, working on health programmes in Africa and Asia. He's also acted as Health Advisor in Irish Aid and is currently the Chair of the Board of the European Estra Alliance, which supports North-South Institutional Health Partnerships. And last but certainly not least, we have activist and PhD candidate Robbie Lawler, and Robbie has been active within the HIV community since his diagnosis in 2012 and is currently a member of ACT UP Dublin, European AIDS Treatment Group, and is a co-founder of the Access to Medicines Ireland Group. And Robbie has a particular interest in grassroots activism and the Access to Medicines movement in Eastern Europe. Um, and his PhD is exploring HIV and hepatitis C treatment activism in the Ukraine. So... You're very welcome, everybody. And this evening's topic is just health. And we're gathered to discuss health justice and the challenges and hope for real solidarity one year into the global pandemic. Um, the past 12 months have been like no other time in our collective memory. Um, the world has been united by a common threat, but at the same time, the response has created and exposed deepening divisions and inequality. And it could be argued that the pandemic has favored the rich and powerful elite, while the world's poorest have suffered further and could take a decade to recover. The past year has also exposed privilege and injustice in all its forms, and it shines a light 
on the unjust structures and strategies that sustain the existing world order. And it's not just a health issue. We live in a global system and it's crucial for our future on this planet that we encourage and promote critical systems thinking in pursuit of sustainable development. And so on that note, we'll start the conversation and um, maybe I could start with you, Mike. And while you're well accustomed to dealing with global health issues, including disease outbreak and response, past year must have been one of the most challenging professional experiences yet. Um, what are some of your reflections on the challenges in dealing with the global pandemic and in dealing with the health related, uh, the related health justice and development impacts more broadly? Um, uh, thanks. That's, that's a, a tough question, Eve. Uh, the second <laughs> part of it particularly. No pressure. Uh, no, yeah. I, I suppose in, in, in our game, we're, we're dealing with epidemics all the time and we're always aware of the potential of pandemics. We're used to frontline epidemic response, but this year has been unprecedented in the sense that all countries have been impacted at the same time. Uh, and then the various collapses we've seen and everything from supply chains <clears throat> to, to the health systems themselves, even in the most developed settings, collapsing under the pressure. Uh, that lack of adapt adaptability, that lack, lack of resilience at all levels in our society, be it within health, uh, society, uh, broader social issues and other things, the, the knock-on effects of this pandemic have been incredible, uh, all the way through to mental health and uh, marginalization stigma everything has been amplified every injustice every weakness in the system is just being uh, exposed and amplified um <clears throat> notwithstanding that the the day-to-day -day demands on on ourselves and who but also on all our partners at national level on everyone being under absolutely intense minute-to-minute -minute demands uh, both at the operational the scientific the financial and other levels so everyone's been operating under extreme strain including our communities, most importantly. Everyone is operating under that strain and it's taking its toll on us all um, and it's taking its toll on society. And there are no easy answers. That's the problem. Working your way out of a crisis as complex as this requires a very uh, careful and measured and managed approach. And I suppose the thing that is maybe disturbing me most in all of that is the lack of cohesion we've seen at both national and international level. Um, a lack of solidarity at times, uh, um, some wonderful expressions of community solidarity, scientific innovation, but we really have to pull the whole package together and uh, uh, we can do a hell of a lot better uh, in future, but we need to do better right now and that's the problem, we're not out of this. So there's a little bit of looking to the green grass on the other side, uh, but we're not close to it yet. So it's very hard to communicate to everyone, even in our own house, especially to communities. So we've got a, a fair bit to go here, but there is some light at the end of the tunnel. The advent of vaccines offers great hope. We, we're saving more lives with therapeutics and better clinical care than we ever have. Those solutions though are distributed hugely inequitously around the world. And that's the problem I think that's most mm -hmm. concerning WHO right now, is the sheer inequity of the distribution of the rewards for all of that collaboration and the rewards of all of that solidarity. Thank you. And is there is is there any um, positive movements that you can see towards um, a better um, equity or equality? Um, it's 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 happening. It's achingly slow. I mean, you could argue, and I think it's a false argument in a way that it took so long to to bring the solutions that we had for HIV, for TB, for malaria and other diseases to bear. And the South waited mm -hmm. so long for these solutions, even though they existed. Uh, they weren't scaled up, they weren't priced in the right way and they weren't delivered in time. Uh, so we are only one year in here. And if you think that it's, uh, it's only 85 days since the first country started vaccinating against this disease. Mm -hmm. 85 days later, this week, we started to deliver vaccine doses to 10 countries under the COVAX initiative. There's 115 economies around the world now back actively vaccinated. Uh, so we have begun probably quicker in any time in history in the process of delivering vaccines to those who most need them around the world. The problem is that 80% uh, of all the 265 million doses we've sent that have been distributed so far 80% of those have been in 10 countries. 
you know, we think about that. It's, you know? it's yeah. incredible. So we have a lot of catch up to do, but we have to also celebrate this week that we have begun and we've put all, we're putting more and more countries on the vaccine map. Now we need to accelerate that. We need to make that move quickly and we need every actor, everyone. This isn't just about vaccinations. This is about advocates and activists. This is about people reaching out to their governments, reaching out to everyone they can. We will emerge from this pandemic together as a more united uh, civilization, or we will emerge from it more inequitous and less fair than we, we, we entered it. And we have a choice. So everyone needs to get on deck for this one. This isn't just a job for doctors and nurses. In fact, we need everyone in society, every activist on board to push and keep pushing on, on access to these tools. Yeah, I completely agree. And as we've seen, frontline workers are not just doctors and nurses. They're people driving buses, people, you know, in the service industry and shops and, mm-hmm. you know, so it's, it's everyone's issue. It's everyone's problem. It's everyone's should be part of the conversation and the, and the push. Um, thanks for that, Mike. Um, Nadine, would you like to join, um, respond to some of Mike's comments and add to your, on some of your own reflections? Yeah, as you say, folly that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I'm look. There's there's so many points um, Mike has made, and I'm kind of I find myself nodding to the points. Um, you know, just agreeing with those points, and um, you know, could, couldn't agree more. I, I I also just first want to say thank you to Mike. Um, you know, it's really lovely that you're you're here with us at home. Um, you know, in Ireland uh, this evening, and I just want you know as as a kind of you know leading this network on global health here in Ireland we've been looking to you and been really inspired by you all the way through this uh, pandemic and um, I just want to say thank you for the integrity that um, that you really show in in the way that you speak and what you do it inspires us and we just do our best to try and follow that so I just want to say that really that's that's how I could follow Mike um so I, I don't know. I mean, coming coming a little bit back uh, back home here. Um, I think you you know you know that um, we started off. Um, you know, as when the pandemic hit as a global health network, we we started saying to ourselves, well, what, what can we do? We're a global health network. And ironically, you know, global health was something that um, we used to be, you know, our, our mission was to inf- is, is to inform and to raise awareness about global health and to educate what is global health, why is global health important overnight global health was household it was a household name and it was quite incredible having for years been chipping away at that to watch how you know global health was viral everybody knew what we were talking about um, and I think you know we responded by um, firstly by saying okay what can we do and we thought okay let's have a conversation let's bring people together and we, we came up with this idea of conversations on COVID and um, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with and we started with one, um, you know, quickly learning how to do this. You know, nobody knows how to do these things until you're under pressure and learning how to do it. And, you know, by the end of the year, um, we ended up with a series of 20 conversations on COVID um, where we had, had, you know, I had have the privilege of moderating those conversations and interviewing over like 100 speakers. We'd had participants from over 70 countries. And we then realized that the viewing of, of those conversations on COVID was over 15,000, which was something we'd never had any experience like that before. Before. Um, and we got to touch on issues like, you know, we got to talk about lessons from HIV and Ebola. We got to look at gender and COVID. We got to look at stigma and COVID, on human rights, on health systems, on health partnerships and, and, their, and the approach of health partnerships um, in COVID, malnutrition, the power of communities, um, disability and inclusion, planetary health, uh, education. So, uh, you know, every time we, we did that, we, we, had a, we had speakers from Ireland and speakers global south and it was fascinating because we were just learning together and this is what I'd love to you know to reflect on as we were learning together nobody really knew any better than anybody else it was a great leveler uh, just like zoom I find to be a great leveler in terms of equity you know we all have exactly the same sized window mm. to, um, to, to, to be in and I, I love that um, but I think for me, I, you know, there was a couple of themes that came out and maybe I'm saying something, I think in some ways I'm, I'm saying a little bit the same as Mike and in some ways maybe um, slightly different. You know, for me, there was there was themes from speaking to those to, to, to the incredible speakers and learning as we went. You know, the first theme was resilience and, you know, resilience of people. I thought it was incredible and um, the resilience of people everywhere. And 
was was the resilience of people, particularly in the global south. And I think we had so much to learn. We were starting to introduce new words like let's pivot. Let's let's think about pivoting here and pivoting there. You know, our colleagues in the global south have been pivoting for years, epidemic after epidemic. And um, so we had so much to learn. So resilience, I think, was 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 huge, a huge learning. The other one was solidarity. Um, and I think that we were able to see very tangible examples of solidarity where we had health partnerships in Ireland, hospitals here, GP surgeries here, already engaged in partnerships in countries like Malawi or Tanzania, who were able to just connect with their partners and start learning and sharing and exchanging information um, and exchanging you know, training and capacity. And that was, that was phenomenal. Um, so solidarity was was there, and the other was creativity and flexibility. And um, you know, I think all of us, from a personal level to everything we were doing professionally, do do more and do do something different. It's like we were flowing along, and everything that we used to do. Had, we had to find a new way to do it. And first of all, it was like, no, we can't do that. We, you know, particularly in development, how can we work with our colleagues in the global south? How can we continue that kind of work? And incredible creativity and flexibility, I think, um, is what I've seen from, from all of the different um, programs and, and people who, 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 you know, who, who came on. Um, and then the last thing was just community responses. And, you know, I know from my own work um, in HIV, um, you know, community responses are always the best responses. We have the most to learn from community responses. But community responses to, um, you know, to COVID have just been um, truly incredible. You know, the, the, all sorts of responses from very small, even in Ireland, you know, the, the, the GAA or, or local, local groups, mm -hmm. athletics groups, you know, delivering food to, um, to houses you know, all the way, all the way to, you know, mobilize community and who we work with. So, you know, they're the kind of themes that I, I you know, I've seen. And I would also say that, um, you know, we were restricted to 5K. Um, we've been restricted to 5K for a long time. And um, I don't feel like we were restricted at all in terms of being able to be as a global community. And I'm really, really grateful uh, for that. So, Maybe I'll leave it there, Neve. I'd love to hear, I really want to hear more from, uh, from Mike and Robbie and David. Yeah, thank you very much, Nadine. Uh, some really interesting reflections there um, and some I'd like to come back to you on, but we'll, as you said, we'll, we'll move on a little bit for now. David, um, uh, would you like to give us some of your reflections and particularly in the Irish context, I suppose, and, and your work here? Yeah, th thanks, Neve. And uh, first of all, I just want to echo Nadine's comments, I think I'm like Nadine and others, all inspired by Mike and really just want to pay tribute to, to all you're doing, Mike, in, in WHO. I mean, I, I've listened to the first two speakers and, and what I picked up was, I think, I had a hopeful and optimistic tone. And as I was reflecting on my own notes here, I think that's kind of the tone I would probably set as well. At the same time, acknowledging what Mike highlighted about the sheer inequity and a lot of what I'm going to maybe touch on is really how some of that inequity and, and inequality is, has, has been there. And looking, starting with our own health service, I work in the health service and, and you know, a year back, we started into this pandemic and it was an unknown. There was a lot of fear, a lot of uncertainty. Would we cope? Would we be overwhelmed? Would we be like Bergamo in Italy? And now we look back a year on and I think we would say the HSE mobilized an, an incredible response. And, and yesterday I listened to Paul Reed, who was launching, our CEO who's launching the HSE corporate plan. And I thought as he reflected on the last year, he did it very well. And, and he said, you know, he said, we've, we've done most things well, and there are some things we could have done better, but we certainly did act. And I think that summed it up well, that we had to respond quickly. We did. With our capacity, we did pretty well. And we will learn maybe some things we could have done better. But he highlighted, too, how we made changes, rapid changes, like we had never done before, and really showed what we could do when we had to. And I think that gives us great hope of what we can achieve into the future. But at the same time, we will we'll acknowledge that the pandemic has showed up weaknesses in our health system, and we've seen... Uh, limitations in intensive care and public health and so on. And, you know, we often speak about weak health systems in the low-income countries. Well, I think the pandemic has shown that all of our health systems have weaknesses. And maybe that's a reason for us all to work more in global sol solidarity and learn from each other. 
Now, looking back on, on our response, just make a few comments or observations in relation to kind of our theme of, of kind of health justice and solidarity. And the first one is about resources. You know, we threw the kitchen sink at this pandemic. Last year, we spent over a billion euros on PPE alone. And this is quite a contrast. Now, before the pandemic, if you were trying to get resources for something, even important in the health service, even what might seem modest resources, they were hard to get for some fairly critical needs for to give people access to important services. And suddenly we, we were able to find resources and, and that must tell us something. And on reflecting on it, I, I think that it may say something about the way we sometimes see health, health and healthcare, it's an expense. Or maybe looking after vulnerable people in our population, it's an expense. And maybe now is the time to think, well, maybe we should see it differently. When we want to, we can invest in these things. Let's see health as an investment. Let's see vulnerable people as an, caring for them as an investment. And then we saw in the pandemic that the vulnerable people society came into focus quite early on. You remember the first wave that we, the elderly people in, in nursing homes were very particularly badly hit. And we realized we hadn't quite given them that enough attention. And, and so that, that brought attention to vulnerable people. And, and what's been very positive is how through the year we've given more attention. We've, we've acknowledged that we need to look after vulnerable people. And as we saw outbreaks happening among the vulnerable groups, among the like asylum seekers, travelers, and so on, we responded to that. And even now we're living under these restrictions. Why? Because we're protecting vulnerable people. And surely that, that's a positive thing. And if, and I think we're not likely to show global solidarity if we're not looking after those with greatest needs in our own society. And then I think we, we learned more about inequalities in Ireland because some of the issues were exposed because we saw outbreaks of COVID in places like meat factories, places where people who are not Irish are working because maybe the salaries weren't good enough for, for others and uh, working in poor, you know, challenging working conditions, poor living conditions, and as a result being exposed to COVID. And similarly, maybe some carers, carers who are living in crowded accommodation, shared accommodation, and maybe working multiple jobs just to earn enough, enough money. And I think we really saw the, understood those issues and we were able to re respond to them for COVID. And if we can respond to them in COVID times, can't we address these more long-term? So then thinking about global solidarity in the, the health service, you know, I think a lot of the time it felt like we were so preoccupied and so intensely preoccupied with trying to deal with COVID-19 here, we just didn't have time to think about other countries. So it wasn't that we didn't care, it's just that we were just maybe too, too, pre too preoccupied. And another aspect was that we weren't able to travel. So I wasn't traveling like I normally would. So I didn't know really what was going on in these other countries. And even people who were there like diplomats and aid workers, they couldn't move around. So they were limited in what they could see. So we did have, I think, limited, limited understanding or limited connection. And yet, despite that, I think there was, where there was opportunity, we showed great solidarity. And Nadine gave some, some nice examples of that. And I think what we saw is where we had relations from the health service, where we had relationships in, in place already with partners in other countries, we were really able to continue working with those people we had to move to digital platforms, but we, we could, and we did, we did, and it worked. And we saw lots of positive things, and Nadine has, has, has highlighted some of those. And just one other thing to add to, I think that the very thing she said was just this, what came out of it, I think were the opportunities of, of empowering people in the countries we work with. Sometimes we go in and we're the dominant force in the relationship, and I think we weren't there, so that challenged them to take more initiative themselves. And I think that was very empowering. And that was very, very positive. So I think there, there's a number of, of issues and um, just to that really, I think were highlighted for me through the pandemic uh, in terms of global inequality and global inequity. I think they've been there since the start. I think the vaccine issue has really brought them into stark focus. Um, Irish aid and the development policy talk about reaching the furthest behind first. I think the furthest behind have fallen even further behind. And I think that's a challenge really for all of us. Mm -hmm. But it strikes me that maybe the agenda, the global agenda was really being set by the higher income countries. And maybe, and I wonder to what extent the lower income countries were following that agenda in their responses. And sometimes where they were responding to COVID where maybe the, some of the actions were actually having detrimental effects 
beyond the pandemic? You know, what's the cure worse than the disease? Where people are saying, well, we, are we flattening the, the disease or are we flattening the economy? And we saw that there were many consequences of COVID secondary effects that came about as a result of some of the country responses that may have been influenced by the broader global agenda. And then these some low income countries didn't have the resources that we had to respond. And the bet and standards for good practice were being set in the high income countries, but the global standards were impossible to implement in countries that just didn't have resources. And I was in touch with colleagues in Mozambique recently and hearing that someone visited a hospital, there were no doctors for their ICU that mm -hmm. UN staff were going out on the streets trying to find oxygen masks. And we're talking about standards for PPE and for intensive care and so on. So I think that's, that's, a, that's a big issue. So, so just to finish, uh, just a few challenges maybe that, that finish off my remarks here, that I think we do need to, to build back better after the pandemic, acknowledge that the global system hasn't been good enough for health and development, and that we need to reset it. We need renewed commitment with a different paradigm for global development based much more on, on equality and partnership. For health, I think it's, 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 it's the same agenda, building resilient, sustainable health systems, health systems that will enable universal health coverage. Everybody will get the healthcare they need regardless of their financial means. Systems built from the community up, primary care based, leaving no one behind. That's, that's our agenda. And for vaccination, and I think Robbie will probably say more about this, but just say it's not enough just to put more money into COVAX, we have to increase global production. As long as there's not enough vaccines for everyone, we know who's going to get them first. We've got to address that issue. And, and maybe I'll leave Robbie, I think, might, might want to speak more about that. I'll finish there. Thanks very much, David. Um, and lo loads and loads of interesting points there that we could, see, we could go on all night about. Um, I think, Robbie, one of the things I suppose that I picked up there and also from Nadine is the lessons learned from HIV, from the Ebola crisis, from other pandemics and crises, particularly around vaccines and, and response. Um, what do you see as uh, some of your the challenges and some of your reflections um, on that? Well, it was for... For one, I just want to say it's a privilege to be part of this team of amazing global health experts here. But um, I am here as a representative of Access to Medicines Ireland, and um, I really want to kind of go into detail um, a little bit more of what's been said about the structural issues about why we do have such inequitable access to COVID technologies during this pandemic, during this global catastrophe. Um, and it's these structural uh, issues that have led to this inequity is the reason why Access to Medicines Ireland was set up in the first place. And our overall goal is to ensure structural reform to the current intellectual property regime. And the reason why we have this goal is because in Ireland over the years, we have seen so many campaign groups fighting for access to so many different treatments and preventative drugs. And these drugs have either been denied reimbursement or have been significantly delayed. And it's just resulted in untold harm to so many people in Ireland due to their excessive price. And we've seen total public expenditure on uh, pharmaceuticals totaling 2 billion euro in 2016 and exceeded 2.5 billion in 2019. So this is half a billion increase in three years. And in 2019, all funding for new drugs was nearly exhausted just two months into the year um, in Ireland. So we know the drug price trajectory is only going up. And so that's why we're looking for structural reform, because the root of the problem is patents. Um, patents is where we give pharma companies 20 plus years monopolies over medical technologies, which encourages them to price medicines as high as possible so they can make the biggest profit. And these patents allow pharma companies to keep their technology and data from pharma companies. So, you know, prior to the world realizing how bad this pandemic was, Access to Medicines Ireland was a super busy organizing, I think it was our fifth annual conference in the Royal College of Surgeons Ireland. Um, and at these annual conferences, we focus on the issues of intellectual property, but also the solutions to overcoming these. But when Europe started to go into lockdown, the severity and scope of this pandemic uh, really started to become a lot more real to us all. And we knew that we needed to make last year's conference solely based on access to COVID-19 technologies. So we did that on April 7th uh, over Zoom like the rest of the world. Um, but on April 7th, we knew intellectual property was going to be an issue. And this is where the history informs uh, our response today, because many of us on this panel have worked in the HIV world. 
Uh, HIV medication became available in the global north in 1996. Okay, so people of this amazing medication, myself, got access to this treatment. We stopped dying of AIDS. But it took 10 years and millions of deaths for the same medicines to be available in the global south. And this is due to drug, uh, drug monopolies and high priced drugs. So all HIV activists know that what we had to go through to get access to our treatment. And it is absolutely the wrong approach to ending this pandemic. Um, this is a wrong approach because we had to go country by country, drug by drug, and use many different routes that we had to fight to and nail for to be available to us to reduce the price of these drugs. So this is a real piecemeal approach. What we need here is a sustainable and practical trade solution to overcome this pandemic and to prepare us for future pandemics too. Um, and since our online conference uh, back in April last year, our worst fears have actually come to light. So uh, in June, we saw the US secure the whole world stock of remdesivir. At the time, we thought remdesivir was a good therapeutic for um, uh, COVID. Three months supply of the world stock. And Gilead, who was the patent holder on this, was not going to uh, drop the patent and allow generic manufacturers to make this quite simple molecule. And we are seeing it now, as Dr. Mike Bryan and everyone else has said, you know, we are seeing a complete unequal distribution of vaccinations, with wealthy nations taking up the majority of vaccines available, while lower income countries are not expected to be vaccinated until 2023 or later. And I'll finish on this because I know I'm taking up a bit of time, but I'm just very, very thankful that the COVID Technology Access Pool, or the CTAP initiative, is back which is backed by the World Health Organization and was established by the Costa Rican government, um, is something that we can push as uh, access to medicines activists, as uh, health groups. CTAP is basically a mechanism in which pharma companies can voluntarily suspend their patents and share their technical know-how of how to develop uh, and manufacture these vaccines with other pharma companies, okay? This will increase much needed manufacturing capacities of COVID technologies. This is why we've been advocating so hard for the Irish government to sign up and use their leverage with the pharma companies based here to join up with CTAP too. Okay, thanks a million, Robbie. Um, and, and I'm getting educated now on CTAP there now. Um, <laughs> um, and maybe, Mike, uh, maybe you could uh, tell us a, a little bit more about that. And if, I, like, I'm wondering, is there, is there political will to, to challenge um, these structures, to change? Is, is that solidarity there, that will to change there among... Um, Big different big global organizations and in, in relation to CTAP? I, I think there's lots of things potentially going on the right direction. I think uh, it's very positive that Madame Ngozi is now going to take over at the WTO. I'm sure uh, she's been a great champion, been an ex finance minister from Nigeria, and someone who's actually led and been the co chair of the ACT Accelerator. So she's actually led and driven a lot of the discussions around. So there's nobody on this planet more briefed right now going yeah. in as head of WTO who's been intimately involved in all of the issues about access to COVID tools, the COVAX initiative, the therapeutics and other things. CTAP is, and again, thanks to, <clears throat> to the leadership of Costa Rica, it's a real opportunity for us to build something, but it's a, it's a shell in the sense that it's a process that's being proposed, but the issue is now getting the technologies into that process. And I think it's also um, a little complicated by the fact that it's not just products, and I'm sure, Robbie, you'll agree, it's not just a patent on the actual molecule or the tool. If we look at some of the technologies we have now, uh, for example, we talk about mRNA uh, vaccines, the nucleic acid vaccines, the ones you've seen like Pfizer and Moderna. <laughs> The technology for them is not just the development of the messenger RNA, it's the package that it comes in. And it's quite a complex technology. It's not the actual product, it's the technology that delivers that at high quality. Similarly, when you, we look at the other vaccines that come, they're vectored vaccines. It's using other, usually very mild viruses like adenoviruses or RSV viruses and inserting <clears throat> genetic material that allows them to express a protein from uh, coronavirus or from SARS-CoV-2. So it's not just the actual product. You can't just mm -hmm. transfer the patent or hand someone the, the blueprint. You've got to transfer the technology mm -hmm. as well and the know-how and the capacity to scale up. <clears throat> and I think that's a barrier uh, now as well. This tech transfer 
uh, takes time, takes transfer time, takes a real commitment on behalf of the, 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 the company or the entity in the north transferring that technology to allow safe and effective scaled up production in the south or in other, in other countries. We're seeing it. I mean, the AstraZeneca vaccine is being produced uh, under contract by uh, the Serum Institute of India and also being produced in Korea. That's contract manufacturing. That's very different to the transfer of the intellectual property and the technology to produce those vaccines in country. So there are many different gradations on how we cannot scale up production. <clears throat> You've seen yesterday, I think Merck have agreed to help with producing uh, the, the, one of the, <clears throat> the J&J vaccines. So we can see partnership between companies to scale up production of a certain product. We can see contract manufacturing where one company subcontracts to another to produce, and that can happen in the South and it has happened. But the real holy grail is to move to full transfer of intellectual property and the tech, the transfer of the technology and the know-how to sustain that production in the South. So uh, all of the things like CTAP, patent pools, uh, the work of the WTA, it all needs to come together. And Robbie is right. It's not a simple, straightforward thing. It requires high level political commitment. It's not just a health issue. It's a trade issue. It's an intellectual property issue. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's an economic uh, issue more than it is, in a sense, a health issue. It's about companies and profits and who has the right to make money and when is the right to make money superseded by the right of people to survive. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can I just come in on that, on that point? Because yeah. I agree with everything you say there, uh, Mike. Um, you know, in terms of uh, innovative ways of which we can speed up this technology transfer hub, you know, uh, Dr. Michael Fried, uh, Martin Fried, sorry, from the mm -hmm. organization, I think he is the coordinator for the vaccine delivery systems at the World Health Organization. Yep. But I was at a, a webinar with um, the Knowledge Ecology International. And he basically said, you know, to overcome this, and there's a precedent there, is during the influenza um, pandemic in the uh, late 2000s, you know, uh, countries all over the world was like, actually, there's not enough manufacturing uh, uh, facilities to meet our global supply or global need. So what they set up was in uh, Netherlands, I believe, in a vaccination institute, that um, specializes in transfer, uh, technology transfer was set up a transfer technology hub. So that was instead of using all this human resource of pharma companies mm -hmm. to go to different pharma companies around the world, they had this hub where all pharma companies came to them were experts and they get them, of course, not just the blueprints, but they helped them for every step of the way that, um, through every process to uh, set this up in their own uh, uh, yeah. manufacturing uh, uh, bases. But the there's a caveat to that. That was based upon vaccine. That was an egg-based development, okay, of a vaccine, which is the old ones done a hundred years. But uh, Martin assured us that he'd done a scoping exercise to see do these um, experts exist in setting up the tech transfer of MRPA, yeah. and he said they do. So yeah. I like it's a big pharma narrative to say, oh, this takes time, we shouldn't do it, and it kicks the can down the road. Mm -hmm. We should be saying, actually, no, we've done it before, we can do it now, and we really need to, at every step of the way, you know, Mike and I include everyone in this, to overcome this narrative, especially when even people in the world health organization are, are coming out with these, you know, solutions. Um, so I think these are real initiatives, and I always like to say, you know, we, how much vaccine candidates did we get in a year authorized? You know, people said it couldn't be done. We just landed a little Mars rover 190 million miles away with a little helicopter, you know. I think we can transfer um, technology across the pond to other things. Like, we just need a political will, as you were saying. Um, but we need to push it. And um, even if it takes two, three, five years, although, you know, evidence shows it can only take a few months to do this technology transfer from pharma companies, we should still do that. And we should still do that and push for that because then we will have manufacturing capacity in lower middle income countries. And this will help us prepare for future pandemics. So there is literally no reason why we should be listening to pharma who just don't want to share the technologies, even though so much of this technologies came from the public, the taxpayers' money, you know? So we should be fighting this too, every step of the way. I think Thanks, uh, maybe I could I just come back on that because I think it's, yeah. a, it's, it's, it's a really 
a really important point. 50 years ago, 40 years ago, the vast majority of vaccine production was produced by state-based vaccine production. There was very little private farmer involved. It was seen as a state's responsibility to produce vaccines for its own people and for others. And an awful lot of countries around the world had that. <clears throat> What's happened over time with the various development cycles and the, the risks, the financial risks that are taken to produce vaccines is that's consolidated into a very small number of companies, or it had consolidated into a very small number of countries. <clears throat> but we have seen over the last few years really credible vaccine production emerge in the South, real capacities. Yeah. emerge in the south and that needs to be further accelerated it's not that it doesn't exist it exists but it needs to be facilitated with tech transfer with support martin fried is a visionary in this space martin is a fantastic individual i believe you know it can that can be done and i think we can pool not only the patents but we can pool tech transfer capacity and share that as well we do that all the time uh, with with other things so the, the sky's the limit it's a matter of deciding you know, as John F. Kennedy said, we do these things not because they are easy, but because they are hard. This is a hard thing to do. But the prize at the end of this could be much more sustainable mm -hmm. production of vaccines in future crises and a much mm -hmm. more equitable and rapid rollout for everybody, not just for the North and the South, but for everybody. Um, and roll out a vaccine that's more equitably based on need and epidemiologic parameters and not based purely on the parameters of the ability to pay. And that's a problem uh, we have right now. So I think the sky's the limit of what can be achieved. We're not there yet. We're not in the worst place we've, we've ever been. There's a huge amount. And I think for WHO, is, this is a, a new space for us too. WHO has tended to stay out of these um, issues at times to avoid getting um, into political difficulties. But we have to engage robustly with the private sector on these matters. There are issues that are ethical. There are issues that are absolutely fundamental to the future of universal health access, as, as David said uh, earlier. So this is no longer a situation where member states can just discuss with each other the issues. We need to strongly engage the private sector and we need to lay down what are the ground rules for how the private sector can and should operate. Because if, if, if a company wishes to produce and make, <clears throat> make understandable profits in, its, in a given country, it also has to participate in global processes that, that result in solutions for everybody. And I think we're getting there slowly. We're slowly moving in that direction, but it won't happen without a lot of pressure. So we need, uh, we need groups like your own, Robbie, and many of us just to keep pushing. It's easier for us to keep pushing when you're pushing us, I find. <laughs> I, I think that's very true. And I mean, David made a point earlier about, you know, the global agenda being directed by, uh, you know, Western nations. I think that that's the way it always has been, but that has to change. And there's been a huge amount of reports and calls uh, coming out now where we're looking at global inequality, the deepening divisions and deepening inequality, and that it's not enough to just get back to where we were. We need to, we need to move beyond that. We need to change the way we're working completely. We need to challenge that global world order. We need to start focus, focusing on things like social, social progress rather than economics, economic growth. We need to look at how we're using the money that we generate rather than how much money we generate and using it more wisely. Um, and I think, Robbie, you've made a great point about, you know, we've, we've just watched as NASA did something incredible and put a little rover up on Mars. But look at all the all the nations that came together to do that. Look at all the, you know, all the mines, all the money, all the investment, all the creativity that came together to do that. Why can't we do the same thing with vaccines? You know, it, it just needs the same push. It needs the same will. It needs that, that solidarity that we saw in getting a little thing to Mars. <laughs> To, to protect people's lives and, and to, to get to be see more solidarity. Uh, Nadine, you've been sitting there nodding away. I'm sure you're dying to. <laughs> Actually, no, I'm really enjoying this conversation. Um, I'm, I'm just loving the conversation. Um, I was just thinking when you were talking about getting the, 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 uh, the little robot on, on Mars, I was just thinking um, this morning I was um, in the uh, Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB and Malaria Partnership Forum for Asia and the Pacific. And that's something that, you know, the Global Fund normally brings together um, the different regions to inform the development of the new strategy. And this morning we were doing it online. 
And there we were, 200 people online, effectively managing to communicate, you know, make positions, uh, be clear in advocacy, you know, well organized. So I think in global health, we have, we are seeing that kind of creativity. It is possible to do things at all levels and always, and we're seeing that. And I think on the issue of, of, of vaccines, what I've been seeing and really feeling deeply in the last, you know, the last, probably the last few months particularly is that I feel like the, this issue right now is causing polarization where solidarity was before. So we've had a really good run of solid mm. solidarity. You know, you've got the issue of vaccine hoarding where you have, you know, Canada, you know, hoarding five times as, as having as five times as many vaccines as they need and um, Europe having two times as many vaccines as they need. And then that lack of, as Robbie was saying, and, and Mike, um, you know, that lack of manufacturing capacity and know-how being, being shared. And it's creating an us and a them which is something in development we work so hard to um to level and um you know as as we all know it's a we and you know mike your own words have been so clear to all of us no one is safe until everybody is safe it's really simple there is no question I know it's a, maybe a strange, a strange kind of twist or a strange way to turn it, but I do also think that this issue of COVID and vaccines presents an, a, an incredible opportunity in terms of equity. You know, I've been working in HIV for over 25 years and we've been, as Robbie has said, you know, fighting for equity and justice in all sorts of ways. Because COVID affects everybody, it's like we're having a universal lesson on equity. A universal lesson and we actually that creates a unique opportunity to actually crack the equity equity nut and call me um you know call me naive naive or positive in that sense but really unique and it's it's really a chance just for us all to understand that every life is actually valuable every life is valuable and i think we've seen that you know I, i'm thinking about some of the work that i've been doing in zimbabwe and um, with beyond stigma where you know, the, the women living with HIV in Zimbabwe have been so badly affected by, not by COVID per se, but by the effects of COVID, by the lockdowns that have been put in place. So the women living with HIV, they'd be, you know, they'd be women who work in, in marketplaces. You know, they live hand to mouth, they go out every day, they sell food, they sell their, their wares, they buy food for their family, they come home. With the lockdown and the severity of that, they haven't been able to, to go out, they haven't been able to work. And so they are starving. So hunger becomes the issue. And if you want to talk about inequity, you know, hunger as an issue, you know, how, how can that, you know, the ripple of, of the vaccine discussion has a chance to really try to target inequity in all sorts of ways, including, for example, you know, for, if we know in the pandemic that women have, uh, you know, we've seen an increase in gender-based violence. The women, what I'm talking about, my friends in Zimbabwe, mostly disproportionately affected are women. Um, you know, there's huge inequities, schools, you know, we've been involved here in Ireland in talking about you know, our children going online and how is that going to happen? And, in, you know, in countries like Zimbabwe and, and, and some places like in Kenya, electricity is an issue and online school is not going to happen. And those mm -hmm. children are cared for. It's not just education, but it's it's how they're brought into into the system and cared for. And that's at the moment broken. So I think that this COVID is, is really, I think Mike said something like that, it's shining a light on so many other things that, that really speak to inequity, but in a way that we can all understand. It's not a discourse that's happening over there on the side. It's, it's a worldwide discourse on inequity. Yeah, and if, if, if I could follow that, uh, Nadine, when you talked about how this, is, this time is an opportunity to address inequity. And I think there's been, in Ireland, there's been a real shift in the last number of weeks. And I think you've seen as we roll out the vaccine, like we're there every day, we're being told how many people have been vaccinated in Ireland. Like there's intense pressure for every vial of vaccine that comes in to be into someone's arm within no time. And, and I think that thanks to a lot of the advocacy around the, the, the global equity issue with vaccines, it's really got out there in, in, in the media. And I think going beyond just the issue of equity, so not everyone will buy into equity. Some people will be just thinking of ourselves, but what we're seeing is that actually, this is also about what's good for us. If, even if you disregard, if you're not so concerned about the rest of the world, actually, if we want to solve the problem for Ireland, we've got to have a global approach. And, and I think that message is starting to permeate in, in, in Ireland. And, and hopefully that will, that will be an important and a significant driver because I think there is this, you know, like our government's under huge pressure to deliver in terms of the vaccine here. 
And I think we have to kind of, it has to be understood, I think, to change some of the approach is really to see that actually for us here, the need is also to address it out there and, and to see that it's, it's, it's that global approach that's where the solution is. Thanks very much, David. I'm just when, you, you, when we're, the conversations that that you you both have just had, and Nadine particularly as well, around some of the things you were saying. I mean, you know, I think we need people are starting to make the connections between health, between climate change, between the economy, and the, people are slowly starting to make the connections. And it's not that they weren't, but more and more people are starting to make the connections, and that's really really important. And I think we need to grab onto that and run with it. Um, because, you know, as Micah said, there's, there's, unless we address those issues now, we're going to see more variants and, and more pandemics, you know, and we're going to be under more pressure and, you know, where does it end? So this is, this is a real opportunity. Um, I'm conscious that we have some, we're coming up to 10 to 8 and we have some questions um, coming in from, from the audience. Um, it, it, it's, it's easy to forget when you're on Zoom that you have an online audience that are out there and part of the conversation. Um, and I'll take this opportunity to remind you all guys that are uh, watching uh, online, please do uh, subscribe and share the, the, the live link, bring other people into the conversation and get more people on board and, and engaged in these issues. Um, so we have we have two questions so far here on the um, on the chat. So one of them is about patents, um, and the question is, what is the responsibility of the funders of research, um, as in charities and government, and discoverers, researchers and university, in the negotiation of licensing selling of patients with the industry, and that that comes in from Sorka. So I can read that again if if you want. Fine. I think this is a fantastic no. question. Oh, can you hear me? <laughs> this is fantastic. Thank you. Look how happy Robbie is with that question. <laughs> you <laughs> must have planted that and question. It sounded like you planted that. Yeah, one, I think so too, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Never. <laughs> that is a fantastic question. Um, what we're seeing now is a complete unequal public return on public investment of COVID mm. technologies. Mm. Like, let's go through some of these vaccines. Like, Moderna received $2.5 billion in government assistance. BioNTech, which created the Pfizer vaccine, received $450 million in government support. The Johnson & Johnson uh, vaccine got $2 billion in public funding. The AstraZeneca vaccine might as well just be called the Oxford vaccine, because um, they've done the majority of this. Um, back when we did our conference, you know, great advocates like Ellen to Owen said that we should put conditions on this public funding that these should be for a public good. But the EU and the NIH in America didn't. And we are seeing that now because we literally just gave all this public funding to pharma and now they have a patent on it. And they get to choose what to do with this in terms of price. So governments uh, and charities, uh, philanthropy on top of this, I wish Dolly Parton would have put in a condition on her <laughs> 1 million donation but they have a massive, massive responsibility. And this goes outside of COVID technologies, you know, the bedrock of the majority of innovation of uh, medicines, new and uh, research development of new medicines comes from uh, basic research that is done in universities and public institutes. So in every single way, we should always say that all public funding should come with the condition that this is public good. Um, so yeah, massively, massively. And, and actually one learning that we got from this pandemic is the reason why we got these vaccines so quickly onto market, um, one of the big reasons was there was so much public funding and international collaboration on this. When we have issues such as phar pharma companies divesting from antibiotic programs because they're not, um, what would you say, profitable, do you know, this is a real model that we could use that we pump loads of public funding into it, but on this public funding, we have conditions that these antibiotics are for public good. So um, I do think that there can be a lot of learning from this too. Thanks for the question, Sorka. <laughs> can I uh, just maybe follow up a little? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Robbie, you're, you're a hard act to follow actually on these issues, so that's good. <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, I, I, I think you're right, uh, but I think it's important that we don't put all of pharma into the same box. I've worked with various forms of pharma 
over 25 years. And the people who work in those companies are committed scientists. They go home and they want to kiss their kids on the head and feel they're saving the world too. And they have every right to do that. Some of them are some of the finest researchers in the world. And we've worked very closely through meningitis outbreaks, cholera outbreaks, other things. And we've co-developed products <clears throat> with uh, some, uh, and, and there are pharma companies in the, in the South who are really, you know, making advances. But I think the point you make around understanding what the public investment is in this upfront, I mean, even at the global level, long before COVID-19, we had worked together globally with science and research on developing the target product profiles for a coronavirus vaccine should we ever have a coronavirus pandemic. A lot of the preliminary work in defining the pathways to producing the vaccines, a lot of work was done on trial protocols and uh, setting those up. There was a lot of work done on indemnification schemes and allocation schemes and all of this stuff that's done at the public expense. Uh, I think the pressure very often in academia, and we've seen this, and it can sometimes be very helpful. If I give you the example of the Ebola vaccine, was developed in Canada by the by the government, uh, by the, the national labs, who then partnered with a small company to take the thing to the point where we could have a trialable product. But then to take it to scale, they needed to go to a company like Merck and take that uh, vaccine to scale. We were able to take that to scale, bring it to the field, test it, and we now have a licensed uh, vaccine on our hands. And the company are continuing and have built a new plant to produce that in Germany. now. Not that that's ever going to produce a tremendous amount of profit in the north. I mean, the, the fact remains that the guarantee of production for the south is very welcome. So there are good things that happen. They're not, you know, it's not all bad. But there is this, I think, very often when academics develop their product, they're so afraid that they can't develop it any further. It's almost like been a, it's very equivalent to the music world. You know, you write your songs and you get your band on the go and all of a sudden a big label comes in and picks you up and then just crushes you for the next number of years and extracts all of the good it can before it casts you to the side. There's a bit of an element of that. I think we can be very naive and I think we need to be less naive. There's little point of sitting on the side and crying that they're not treating us well and they're not treating us fairly. We need to get smarter. Academia needs to get smarter. Uh, the state needs to get smarter about the investments it makes and the and what it extracts in commitments at that early phase, Robbie, that right up front is hard. It's very hard to, to complain after the fact when we, you know, you haven't, we haven't written the small print. Uh, and I think we need to get better in the state sector and in the academic sector in ensuring that our innovation and, and, and our, our, our development work is, is, is properly reflected in the rules around pricing and patents that come, come downstream. There is an advantage, big pharma, does have that capacity to take products quickly from A to B, right? and it does it in a way that we've lost that capacity, as I said, in the state sector. We've let our state vaccine production sector wither, absolutely wither on the vine, and we're paying a heavy price for that now. Uh, you'll see, actually, uh, interestingly enough, in Cuba, the Finlay Institute has just produced its first vaccine. That's a vaccine institute. We have others, uh, Biomanguinas and others in, in, in Brazil. and There are other vaccine producers around the world that have been historically state supported. So we may need to go back to some kind of public private sector model where the state has more interest in the production of these global goods right up front. But there's still the opportunity for, for pharma to make its, 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 its impact and make its, its money. But that, that is a controlled process. It's not a nuclear reaction out of control. It's not, new, not an explosion. It's a reaction that leads to what we want it to lead to. Uh, and I think, um, I think we all have to step back now in the aftermath of this and realize we've had some success, but a, you know, a lot of failure too. And is there a better way to do this? And I think everyone is crying out. I think even industry themselves don't like the position they're in. There's so much pressure on everybody. Maybe not a bad thing. So I think there's enough movement in the system now that if the multilateral organizations and the nation states and the G7 and the G20 and, and the get together and say, you know what, there must be a better way to do this. Certainly in the face of global existential threats, there has to be a better way to do this. And we get the smart heads together and we make sure we keep civil society and non-governmental organizations at the center of that debate and communities at the center of that debate. And we don't take this to the side so the adults can discuss what we do for the children, you know, which is the paternalistic view that usually transpires at the end of these processes. So Robbie, we need you and, and Nadine and others 
and everyone, we need activists to be central to this discussion and to see where it goes. I, I know it's promising stuff after the fact. We have a lot of work to do in the coming months and we will do everything in our power. Uh, and I hope people are, are hearing WHO, I think maybe for the first time in its history is beside itself on driving equity issues. Uh, and, and, and that comes from a, from a, a secretariat that now is you know, populated by people who, who are absolutely committed to this as a principle for our organization serving communities better uh, and being braver when it comes to these issues. And uh, as I say, we can only be that brave when we have people you know, who are out there pushing for this new way of doing business. So back to you. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, I have a couple of more here on the, on our, uh, the chat. I have one that I have to read out first, and it's from Sorka, the previous question. And she says she's not a plant. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. What do you think, Mike? <laughs> um, I think Sorka is a very uh, smart person. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have another question here, and it's a comment here from Niall. And he says, fair play, but really jealous of the focus on equitable vac vaccines. Where are the advocates for investment in the basic foundations of public health, nutrition, housing, wash, etc.? From Niall, does anyone want to take on take on that one? That's David's. That's David's yes. wheelhouse. Yeah, it was exactly the same thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's we we have maybe kind of alluded to that to some extent. I think in mm -hmm. Mike's comments that this is not just kind of a health issue in terms of a healthcare issue or a vaccine issue. That is a much broader issue about health and development. And, and to me, what it speaks to is that as we go forward and respond and look to a more equitable way of working in solidarity, I think we, we will bring us back to the agenda that we have, our shared agenda of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And I think you'll see core in that are the things that Niall has referred to, that we're not going to solve COVID and the other development challenges unless we take this holistic, inclusive approach that considers all the things that determine development, that determine health, that influence it. It includes the environmental issues. It includes food and nutrition. It includes climate change. I think we have to address all of these things in, a, in a, an integrated way. And we, we have the agenda for that. So... So I think that that's the, I mean, I think, I think my touch on the key point is, is not to see something to like, I know Niall has talked about kind of these various aspects of public health, but not to see something like COVID as just a pure health or healthcare issue. And I think we learned that with, with HIV, that the countries that responded well addressed HIV as a broad development issue affecting all sectors of society, but not just as a disease. The same with COVID, it affects all aspects of, of our lives. And we need to see understand how it affects those different aspects and respond in that, that holistic way. Yeah. Maybe we need a bit of uh, south-north technology transfer here too, Neve, because, uh, you know, the complex systems of the north um, haven't exactly been serving people very well. If we look at, you know, where are the real death rates in, in this pandemic? They're amongst people who've been underserved in health for decades people who have hypertension, unmanaged, unmanaged diabetes, people who have lacked access to basic health care for decades. They're the ones who are dying. The seeds of this disaster were sown 25, 30 years ago when, when someone couldn't afford to go to see a GP or didn't have enough uh, um, input from their public health services or health services to know they were going to have problems. So I, I think there's an awful lot that has been built into the outcomes. The mortality in this pandemic are, are actually as much mediated by underlying conditions or by underserved older people living in, 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 in nursing homes where we have not focused on their protection. Uh, so I think that there's, a, there's a huge issue underlying. Also, we have very complex systems. How, how can, you know, you've seen it every winter in Ireland and every other country in, in Western Europe. Uh, you know, we operate our health system of, I don't know what the occupancy is, David, but it's probably around 98% of bed occupancy in Ireland at any one time. We run our system right to its limit. And you see with the, all you need is a small uh, outbreak of influenza in the wintertime and our whole system goes into, goes into decline. 
Uh, so our systems aren't built to be resilient. They're also very complex. They fail then in complex ways. Um, I, I liken it to the, you know, the old days in the field for all of us who worked in health development 20 years ago. If your vehicle broke down, you needed a hammer and a spanner and you could probably work most things out and get going again. Now you open the, the, the bonnet of your four wheel drive in the field and you're confronted with arrays of electronics <laughs> and stuff that you cannot fix. Complex systems are hard to fix because when they break, they break in a very unpredictable way and they're very hard to pick apart. Simple systems that are resilient may not do everything, but what they do is they react well to stress and they adapt well to stress. And we've seen communities in the South adapt well to stress because they do it every day. They do it for cholera and yellow fever and meningitis and nutritional uh, other things, right? And, and I think the kinds of adaptations that communities have made in the South, community-based interventions, community-based surveillance, mm -hmm have really provided a lot of protection for communities. And I think that idea of leveraging and, 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 and in some senses, uh, exploiting that community, uh, that intertwined nature of communities and moving away from purely individualistic responses. One of the biggest challenges in this pandemic has been getting people to see beyond the end of their individual noses in terms of the, you know, the, what they see themselves as. And we've seen the countries in which it's been hardest to stop this uh, pandemic have been in countries where individualism uh, absolutely uh, tops the idea of community, community as a unit, the idea of we as community, virtual communities, um, geographical communities, uh, you know, um, it doesn't matter what way you want to define your community. But uh, I think the South has an awful lot to teach the North on how communities can work better together. And so we need a bit of tech transfer the other way, Robbie. Maybe you can help set that up as well. <laughs> Thanks a million for that. Um, I have one, I'm, I'm conscious of time. I have another question here from, um, from our audience, online audience. Yeah, we have two, they're flying in now, hang on. <laughs> um, so we have one from uh, Morgan Clark. Um, what one action would the panel send us home with to help advocate for real solidarity and global health? I have a suggestion. I <laughs> <laughs> Go on, Robbie. Sorry, Mike. I, uh, <laughs> I've obviously took your first uh, spot there. But um, uh, I just kind of want to, uh, I say, do a self plug on, on the amazing work that Access to Medicines Ireland has been doing because we were invited to an Oireachtas Foreign Affairs Committee meeting um, a few weeks ago, and we had the fantastic executive director, Winnie Bionema of UNAID and Dr. David Nabarro from the World Health Organization, who's a special envoy to COVID-19. And unanimously, um, in this cross-party committee, all TDs um, agreed that we should sign up to CTAP, uh, which was fantastic. Um, so we're expecting tomorrow that they're going to write. Uh, they're going to write up a report. So if there's any media here today, keep an eye out for that. But we are expecting and hoping that they are going to uh, support all the recommendations that we made during this Oireachtas committee hearing. So I guess if you want to do one take-home message, is that show our government that they should support CTAP and also uh, that pharmaceutical companies should also sign up to this initiative as well. So just public pressure and get the word out there that this is a mechanism. It's the best mechanism for us to get out of this pandemic the quickest. And would you want to tell uh, the audience where they can find more information there, where they can go and look for, for information on that, where they can share links? Yeah, um, absolutely. So if you go into access to medicines.ie, we actually have uh, links to the live recording of the Oireachtas uh, Committee hearing. It's fantastic. Excellent. Thanks a million, Robbie. Um, does anybody else want to respond to that one about actions that people can do? Yeah, so, I'm I, I happy to respond to it, but I'm not good for yeah. single actions. I, I'm afraid I'm one for many actions. So uh, that's a challenging question for me. But but being working our health service, what's the action I would like? And it's really, I think, in the coming period that our health service would demonstrate in a very practical way solidarity with countries whose health services are struggling at the moment and try and support what they need. And, and for us, I think there's probably three things I see that we're hearing that where needs are. One is responding to COVID itself, the services that are needed for, for COVID-19. And the other, another is 
helping to maintain essential health services so that while the health system is capacity is really challenged by COVID that to continue to be able to provide essential health care because the consequence of not doing it will, will really be serious down the line. And the third thing is supporting health workers. This is the International Year of the Health and Care Worker. And I think Mike talked about earlier about how people, the toll it's taking, COVID is taking on people. It's taking a big toll on health workers everywhere. And I think a key thing we can do in Chum Solidarity is to support the health workers in these low-income countries who work in very challenging circumstances. And one of the particular uh, parts of the, the WHO campaign is in relation to vaccination is that the frontline health workers would be prioritized for vaccination in, in all countries and that they would be, at this particular time, that they would be protected and supported. I think that would be a good way of demonstrating solidarity. Thanks, Amelia. Um, maybe, maybe I'll, I'll yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, great question, Morgan. Um, you know, I think for me, I mean, it's gonna sound, it's gonna sound corny and I mean it, it's like, what, what do you want to spread? in this in this um, pandemic what do you want to spread what do you want to be involved in and and for me it, it's it's really clear i want to spread solidarity and love i don't fear it's really clear so so go to yourself you know we can sometimes hide behind systems and organizations and processes go to yourself and start right here what can i do how can i show up what language am i using am i doing that we and them kind of thing what can i do where i see somebody else doing it and um, so that would be one um, very you know just just from 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 ourselves as people and the other would be just to always always know that there is a way <laughs> That's what I've learned this this year. Always know that there is a way. There's going to be, and it can't be. There's another way, and the best way to to find that, particularly when when we're working with countries in the global south, is to ask them, what what do you need? How can we help? And we've seen incredible things. And I just wanted to give a shout out to the Gori Malawi Partnership, a small GP a surgery in Gori here in Wexford, who partners with a hospital, a small hospital in, uh, in Malawi, and asked their partners just that last year, already involved in a partnership, asked their partners what did they need, and since then came up with a series of 15 animated hospital uh, to, to basically prepare for COVID and to work with COVID and with people and, and how, you know, their health workers. It has had 2 million views so far all over Africa. It's amplified. So find a way. Don't, you know, find a way and ask the people who, who are most affected. Um, and the other thing is just to be open to learn, you know, to be open to learn and, and listen. Um, I think that's, that's for me, the best way to, um, to show solidarity. And I think there's some exciting things, you know, around development. I think one of the things I'm learning is that, you know, David alluded to it a little bit, but how we thought it was going to, you know, how development has been delivered until now, we've now seen a different paradigm. What, sh what we've seen in the last year is it's not necessary for us to be traveling all the time. Um, to Niall's point, we can influence the environment in small ways, um, you know, by, by not traveling all of the time. Um, and then it means that local capacity is being built in a way that's a lot seen um, so far. So there's a few points. Thanks, um, Just on my side, just to add in what I think Nadine said was very powerful, everyone else too. But I, I, I do think, uh, and it's been mentioned throughout the discussion, uh, is really, are we, we need to all ask ourselves that question, are we really focused on the right things right now? You know, we have the pandemic, we have climate stress and change, we've got, you know, lives and livelihoods and social justice, sustainable growth versus, the, you know, the pursuit of, you know, absolute growth as a, you know, as an objective. I mean, these are the things that should now occupy us. These are the things that should, you know, I think Carl Sagan called it the pale blue dot. We only became aware of our togetherness when someone took the first photo from the moon of this planet and what we share. I think we've all become more aware of that in the last year. We're becoming more aware of that, you know, as or as climate change has reared its, its head. So the, the, I, I do think it is a moment for a really deep reflection. And, and for what I would call constructive disruption. We need to disrupt the status quo and the norms and all of the accepted um, 
uh, ways of, of doing business. But at the same time, we need to be constructive in that disruption. So we move forward to something that's better for our kids. Uh, and, and doing that, uh, taking systems apart requires that you put them back together again, says the guy that, you know, takes the skybox or something else apart and can never put it back together, right? But, you know, <laughs> it's, uh, it's I, I do think we have to really reflect on that. And, and, and again, you said it, Nadine, you know, it's not all these numbers we used, hundreds and billions and 70 trillion and dollars. And, you know, we've all, we're using numbers left, right and center. But, and we do this in epidemiology all the time. I always say it, David, you know, he teaches students, you know, N equals a billion, 7.4 billion. And I keep saying it, N equals one. One person, one life. One vaccine saves a life. One life matters. One action changes a life. And it's not an action far away. It's an action of kindness towards a person on the bus or it's an action of, you know. So I do think we need to get back to understanding that all of the great things that ever happened had happened because the ones add up to the hundreds and the thousands and the millions of things we do. So, you know, I think we do need to change just the way we, we look at our planet and look at our civilization and, and look at our society. It's, it's, it's ours. It doesn't belong to big pharma and it doesn't belong to politicians. Uh, it doesn't belong. It belongs to, to the citizens of this planet. And I think we need to find a better way to, to, to reflect on that. And that's what equity and solidarity is, actually. Finding a way to, to reshape our society that is just a little bit fairer um, and a little bit kinder and a little bit more reflecting what we want to be as, as human beings. Um, I keep saying it. I'm a little bit ashamed of the planet we're handing over to our kids. You know, I mean, we, we get an F minus, you know. Uh, on this one um, and I, I'm, I'm absolutely determined that we do a little bit better you know soon so uh, I think that's what we all need to reflect on and no 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 one has all the answers and it's not about big multilateral organizations or big big g7s or g20s this is right down to the very bare bones of the DNA of our communities um, uh, and uh, and I think it has to come from that bottom up uh, and, and it is coming. It is coming. I can feel it. Uh, but it needs to remain constructive, as I said, constructive disruption that moves towards solutions, as opposed to, as I, I've said it, I say it to my staff all the time, there's two clubs in all organizations. There's the something must be done club. It's usually very big. It's got even bigger in, in this pandemic. And there's, we're going to do something club, right, which is usually very small and get smaller as the, as the going gets tougher. I want more people out of the something must be done club into the we're going to do something club. If we can do that by ones, we'll, we'll make progress. I think that's, I was going to, um, I was going to sum up and say, that it had, does, does Mike, can Mike give us some final words on solidarity? I think you've more than done it there. Um, that's, Fantastic. Construction, something constructive is, is, is what we need to do and we need to do it together. Um, thank you very much, everyone. It's, it's 20 past eight. Um, I, I, I did mention at the start that I didn't think there would be any awkward silences, any gaps I'd need to fill, and I certainly didn't. And I think we could go on for another hour, but um, um, thanks very much for your time this evening. Um, does anyone have any final comments before we sign off or do we want to leave it with Mike's uh, fantastic last words? I'll go with Mike's words, I think. I Mike, know. Mike's I words, can. Mike's words. Yeah. Thanks, thanks a million guys for being here tonight. Uh, really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure. What a privilege. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.